Right, so this is the uh, in a nutshell 1.1.1a because it's obviously quite big units. So I had to break it down into different subsections. So in this uh, whole 1.1, we will be looking at all of these five parts. But in this actual video today, we'll just be looking at these two because it gets quite lengthy and I don't want it to go on longer than it should. So um, I'll just get on with it. So part one is the uh, parts of the CPU, really, which I know that if you've done the GCSE, you'll have covered quite a lot of, but we'll go through them nonetheless um, in detail as required. So, first of all, you've got the ALU, which stands for the Arithmetic Logic Unit. And essentially, that is the part of the CPU that does any logic. And by logic, I mean AND or NOT checks. We'll look a bit more of that as we do um, circuit design and logic gates. Um, it also does any of the math, plus, minus, divide, uh, and times and binary shifting, which is where you shift the digits up or down um, to perform divides or times as well, actually. But um, in any way, they're the three things that um, uh, it does, uh, and that's the part of the CPU does that. So that's one of the main parts of the CPU. Uh, the control unit uh, is the part of the processor that coordinates the activity of the components. Essentially, it controls the flow of data, and it tells them when to go and do something. Okay, so that's quite an important little part um, part of the clock is part of the control unit, and by clock it is the uh, part of the CPU that says when th things should go, and it clicks at you know 4.2 billion times a second or whatever. So inside the CPU, obviously it's got to remember certain things, like it has to have a little bit of storage in there, and the storage inside the CPU is called a register. They are very small, but they're ultra fast pieces of memory, and they can store data on address. It's important that you understand they can store data or an address. Data would be a number, 48, 28, whatever. An address would be a location in RAM. Um, so you sort of get two main types of registers. They either store data, a number, or an address. Uh, obviously, all of them are numbers. I mean, they're all binary. But what I mean is, inside the register, it's either going to store some binary that just represents the number 58, or it's going to do a binary that represents the location 58 in memory. So it depends on what it means um, in the register. So a bus um, is a series of wires, really, or tracks that connect internal components together. Uh, they're usually found in blocks of 8, 16, 32, any power of 2. Um, we will look at them more, more in detail in the lessons, but obviously you can look through this. But a bus, essentially, just imagine you've got a big chunk of like 8 wires that go from one thing to another. That's basically what it is. So here are the registers that you need to understand, and there are five in the A level. You only knew four before. So the memory address register, this holds the address in memory, RAM, of where we want to either get or save some data. Um, so basically, it's where you would want to save some data to or get some data from. Okay, so that's basically what that is, because the MAR and the MDR are in charge of getting things in RAM, and we'll go through that a bit in a minute. The memory data register, this stores the data or the instruction that was found in the address of the MAR, or the data we want to save in the address found in the MAR. Right, so this is my imaginary um, system here. You can imagine this is RAM. Um, you'll notice under the address, I've put a dollar at the start. This is just a visual thing that is done to, re to let you know that this data is an address. Um, obviously, it's not actually stored like this. Um, addresses are normally given in hexadecimal, but essentially everything's a binary number, so this could be a binary number. This is just for representation. So this is the address, and this is the data in main memory. So the MAR and the MDR work as a pair. Their job is to either load or save something to and from RAM. So let's look at load. Okay. So how load works is... If you want to load something from RAM, let's say you want to load this data here, you place the address you want to load from in the end MAR, and then the control unit will send a signal called a memory read, and that will read in the data stored in that address and store it in the MDR. So that has magically appeared in there. So these work as a pair. The address is where do you want to load the data from, and the MDR is the data that has been loaded. Let's look at save now. Save is the opposite. 
you place the address of where you want to save it in there. So we're going to save it in A024. You put what you want to save in the MDR. And I'm going to save the number four because that's one, two, four. So this is the number four. Then the computer, the control unit will send a memory write signal. And then suddenly, magically, oh, there we go. Four would appear in the memory uh, stored there. The data would be appearing in the memory that you put in the address register. So the address register always holds an address. Okay, it's either where you want to load or where you want to save. So that's quite easy. And the MDR either is a box waiting to be filled, which it is for load. So it's a box waiting for the data to come from RAM to, or it's the box where you put what you want to save in RAM in. Okay, so the memory data register holds the data, the address register holds the address, and they work in a team to get things in and out of memory. So let's go back to this. We've got the program counter, which stores the address of the next instruction to be executed. So when you're running a program, you need to know what instruction is about to be executed, and programs are stored in RAM memory. And so the program counter is a bit like a bookmark that stores the address of the current instruction in the program we're executing. The accumulator stores the data of any intermediate calculations. So this is when you're doing some maths or anything at all, where you want to do some uh, calculations, you would store that in the accumulator because otherwise the only other option to be would be that you put it back in RAM and then load it back from RAM later. And this would be much slower because registers are much faster. So any intermediate calculations, if you're part of a multi-calculation thing, could be stored in the accumulator. Think of it as your like on a calculator, every time you press five plus six and press equals, it has 11. That 11 could be, could be seen as being the accumulator. It's the current total of any calculations you're doing. And the current instruction register is a new one. Because during the fetch, decode, execute cycle, um, we need to fetch an instruction to decode and execute. This is where you put the instruction when it's ready to be decoded and executed. And we'll get onto that in a minute when I go through the fetch, decode, execute. So, the control unit, okay? The control unit essentially directs operation to the processor. It can send signals along the control bus to the other components. And these signals may include many things, but here are the five main ones it can do. Um, it can do a memory read, which is what we talked about a minute ago. So data stored at the address located in RAM will be placed on the bus. So basically it's doing a memory read, like we talked about a minute ago. Or it could do a memory write. It could be sending a signal to say, write some data to RAM, exactly how we said a minute ago. Um, it can do a bus request, which basically means that a device is requesting the use of the data bus. Now you need that because you don't want two devices using the bus at the same time. So the request would go through and then it could either be granted or not granted. Um, and then bus grant says that the access has been granted to the bus by the CPU. And the other thing the signal may include is the clock, and that is that clicking clock that says to everything, go, 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 which we'll look at in the next, in a nutshell, video, I think, depending on how long this one takes. But we will cover all these things. So this is the fetch to code execute. Now at GPSC, we learned this. I'm not going to read it all out because it's on the screen. You can pause it. Now, basically, at the GCSC, you have to understand the fetch. Okay? And then the decode and the execute, you didn't need to know. Um, if you want to go into this in more detail, you can watch my GCSE video on it. Um, as you can for all the other parts of this, the only one that's not in the GCSE is the current instruction register. So that's the uh, GCSE level. At A level, we need to understand the fetch and the decode at more detail. So the same part uh, of the fetch is the same. We go to the, we get the program counter, which is the address of the next instruction to be executed, and we copy it to the memory address register. Then the instruction that's found in the address stored in the memory address register gets copied to the memory data register. Just like before, what I said with the load, but this time we're loading the instruction into RAM, uh, into uh, the memory data register from the address found in the MAR. Now, simultaneously, the program counter is incremented, incremented, exactly the same as the GCSC. Now, the next bit is, because we need to know the decode, we need to know about how the decode works. And the decode works like this. 
that the content that we found in the MDR, which is the current instruction we want to decode, uh, gets copied to the current instruction register so that it can be decoded. Okay, so that's the additional bit that you need to understand. So the instruction in the current instruction register is then decoded. It's split into operands and opcode. And any additional required data could be fetched from memory because the instruction could be to load something. Or it might need some more data to, to be executed. So um, I'm going to go through later what these are in this video. So the opcode is the uh, operation. The operand, although ignore the spelling error, um, either holds your address or the data. But we'll actually leave that for now because I do go through that a lot more later and with the correct spelling, hopefully. So, uh, and then you just execute the instruction with any results stored in the accumulator or main memory because, you know, it depends if, uh, you know. So if the, if the execution says save so to memory, it will save to memory. So there are the instruction parts you need to know. Um, right, now. Words. Um, memory is divided up into equal blocks called words. The length of these blocks in bits is usually a power of two. Okay. Each word is given a memory address. The number of lines on the address bus, with double S there, will affect how many memory addresses there can be. So the address bus has lines, basically tracks, like before, that um, essentially mean how many memory addresses can you have. So for example, if the address bus has 16 lines, then there can only be 65536 different words of memory to use. Because if it's only got a 16 line bus, then essentially you've got 16 bits to have as a memory address. And 16 bits only has 65,536 different combinations. So you can't have um, more than that memory address is because how would you say which memory address it is because you only have 16 bits to allocate a different address to each one so you calculate that, that number is calculated by by doing 2 to the power of 16 so um there you go so when a number of lines in this determines the number of lines turns how memory addresses can be okay here's another example of it an 8 bit or an 8 address line number an 8 width another way of saying it would be 2 to the power of 8, so that would be 256 addresses possible. So I'm just repeating the same thing here. So an address is actually, if you've got an address bus that's only 8-bit, you can literally only have 256 different locations of RAM, which is not a lot. So here's an exam question style. Um, the system has an address line number width of 8 and a word length of 8. What would the total memory capacity be? Right, so what you've got to understand here is that the word length, remember this from before, we went back all the way back up to here because you've probably got um, completely forgotten all that you should. Right, word length is how many bits is in each block of memory. Okay, so if we have an address line number width of eight, that means we can have two to the power of eight number of memory locations, which is 256. There are 256 words we can have, right? Because a word is stored in a memory address. But word length and address a line number width can be different. I could have, although in this case I've used the same number in this example, I could have a 16 bit um, memory, but with only an address line of 8 bit. So I would have 16 bit memory, literally, uh, which would give me uh, 65,566, uh, oh, let, let me look again, go back. Yeah, 65,536, sorry, um, bits of data, but I can only have 256 of them. So the way to work it out is you just multiply them both together, really. So you just multiply the line number width by the word length. So here I've laid out a fake system to show what would happen. This is obviously a terrible system. If I had a four bit memory address, so here's my 16 options, nor going up to 15. Okay, and in my memory, I have two bytes. Okay, so my memory is 16 bit. So I only have 16 chunks of memory, which is two bytes each. Okay, and that means that I can only store 16 different pieces of information in here, 16 different two byte blocks. So one of the questions could be to calculate the uh, amount of total bits you've got. 
And that would simply be the number of rows by the number of columns, if you think about it, because it's 16 wide and 16 high. So 16 blocks and 16 high. So if I then do 16 times 16, I'll get 256, okay? And that is correct if I highlight that. You can see it on the bottom, it's there. It's down there, it says 256. So yeah, there you go, that's how you do it. So that is how you calculate the total bits available with the memory address line number and the word length. So this should be the line number and this should be the word length. I'll just put those above it there so you can see it. So line number on the memory address bus and the word length uh, on the memory. Right, hopefully that was good. So if we look at another example here, there's some different ones I've done here. This is the address line number. This has an eight bit address lines, eight, eight, eight wires. With the word length is 16 and we've got 4,096 bytes. Now what realistically, this is sort of the more modern, you know, bigger numbers. So we've got 32 uh, words, uh, 32 bit address line number. That gives us that many possible memory locations. Three, six, nine. That's 4.2 billion different memory locations. Each one is 32 bits. So I've got times the two together. Just here, I divided by 8 billion because obviously this number is going to be massive uh, to get it into gigabytes. So I divided by, if I did it by a billion, it would have been gigabits. I divided by 8 billion to get gigabytes. So if I had a 32-bit address line and 32-bit memory, I could have 17.17 gigabytes of data, which seems like a more modern cap. Um, but anyway, so then, then I did 16 by 16 and got this. So just multiply the, two, the line number by the word length. Right, data bus. Data can be sent uh, bi-directionally. And what that means is it can go in both directions. Now, if the data bus, and I might need to uh, get paint up again for this, if the data bus has the same width, number of lines, based number of bits that you can send at the same time, as the word length of, of the memory, of the, of the word length, which you just looked at a minute ago, it will only take one operation to send or receive data. And let me explain that. So if I've got, let's ignore the um, bit here. This is my 16-bit memory. So this is 16-bit. If my data bus, has 16 width, 16 lines, basically 16 bit really. Then, because there's 16 wires, each wire can be allocated to one of these. The first wire is that one, that one, that one, that one. You know, so each of those little tracks, I can send that data all at once, okay? If what unfortunately was the, the, the data bus was only eight in width, it would take me two operations to send one piece of memory across. Because I've only got eight wires to send it on. So I'm going to send the first eight followed by the second eight. And there are systems that do that to save money on a data bus. Um, but yeah, so that's what it is. Um, yeah, so that you normally you find they're the same. But just, um, you know, they might ask you a weird question like this. Um, what if it was the data bus was eight and memory was 32? How many instructions would it take to send maybe these four? So let's take this one, for example. That could be an example. I'll just uh, color it. I'll just draw some sort of square. But, can't find the shape, so I'm just going to draw it like this. Let's say they they just had that data on the test. They might say, right, how long, how many instruct, how many uh, operations would it take to send that data along the data bus? And you've got to go eight because it's two for each one, two, four, six, eight because it's going to you know, break it in half. That's the worst line ever. It's only eight wide, so you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I can see that being some sort of exam question. So there we go. So data goes down the data bus. Right, now, earlier on we talked about, let's go back to, all the way back to here, where we've got this part, the decode part of the fetch decode execute. So we're looking at decode now. I've left that till the end because it's complicated. So a machine going instruction, so we fetched the instruction, now we're gonna decode it. It's broken up into two parts, the opcode and the operand. I'm gonna to switch to the um, this, but don't write about the text, I'm gonna come back to that. So this is one 16-bit um, instruction. Now, it's broken up like this. So you've got operation code at the front, which you can think of as the actual instruction itself, like what, what, do you, what do you want the computer to do? And then you've got the data that might be with that instruction, because under the von Neumann architecture, you've got the data and the instruction in memory, okay? So what is the, you know, the instruction part of the data? So let's go back. Okay, so the operation code itself, which is the first part of it, 
um, is the actual instruction, right? But it's broken up into two parts. There's the actual instruction itself, which is called um, the, well, the machine operation. And then there's something called the addressing mode. And the addressing mode means what sort of information is stored in the operand. So the addressing mode actually tells you about what's stored in the other half of the, um, of the, uh, or the other part of the, uh, of the uh, instruction. So there are many options in this addressing mode, but normally it's saying one of two things. And I think this is best described by an example because this is reading out loud now, I can realize you're not going to get this. So let's just go back here. Okay, let's look at this. Now this is the hexadecimal for that. If I take a print screen this, I can go into paint and draw on it, which is always good. Right, let's go into paint. That's the wrong mode. Go into paint here. Okay, so. You may not at this point, if you're doing the, G I didn't do the GCSE, know what a hexadecimal is, but don't worry too much. But I will very quickly explain one, two, four, eight. One, two, four, eight. You can see here. So obviously that is four. Okay, four. That's got, to, you know, add up all the ones with the one underneath it. And this is eight plus four plus one. So that is actually 13. Now a hexadecimal, after you get to nine, a is 10, B is 11, C is 12, and 13 is D. So that's why it's 4D. And the same here, you break this up, obviously all zeros is going to be zero. And here, one, two, and four is going to be seven. So that's where I got that 4D07 from. It's not ridiculously important, you understand that, but I thought best to explain, otherwise you might see what the hell it is. So I'm just displaying that instruction as hexadecimal. Let's go back not too far. Right, so let's assume that this part of it, can I get a better pen? Not really good with this. Right, get a better pen. Right, this part of it is the instruction. And the instruction, let's say we're going to invent this, this, this command, and that instruction on our computer that's not real is going to be to load data from RAM into the accumulator. Right? So it's going to load data from main memory into the accumulator. Now, this is the point. So we've got the accumulator over here, the ACC register, and we need to load something into it. We want some data in there that we're going to use. Right. So what is addressing mode doing then? Right, well, this is it. There are two options. There's more complicated than this, but I'm going to simplify it. There are two options with what's in the operand. There can either be an address to the data, or there can actually be the data itself. So here's what I mean. So let's assume, I'm reading this bit here now, this is where the addressing mode matters, because if the addressing mode is set so the operand holds an address, then when we execute the data, the, when we execute it, the data stored in memory address 07, because this is 07, would be loaded into the accumulator. So if this was set to address mode, then we would be going to RAM, going to the word that's at 07, and whatever data is stored in there, let's say the, you know, the data's got 71 in it, 07's got 8, Two in here, you know, like this is the uh, this is the word address, right? Yeah, address. This is the data in RAM. Okay, so then oh, if we would have that, then 07, oh, then 82 would be loaded in because 07 memory address stores 82. But if we were to change the addressing mode to something else, it could be that we set it to data. So instead of saying that the actual um, operand has got and addressing it now it's got data so now this data is 07 so 07 would actually be which is 7 obviously so the accumulator would actually have 7 loaded into it rather than a memory address so an instruction can actually store the address of some data we want or it can store the data we want and we need to look at the addressing mode to find out which one it is the addressing mode if you google for addressing mode you're going to find out it's loads more but at this level of the course, that's all you need to understand. That this is the instruction. This is what is in the operand. Is it an address or is it actually the data? And that's all you need to understand for the decode. That's what part of the decode does. And obviously, once it's decoded it, it would then execute it. And, um, yeah. and that's basically all that part there. So, um, yeah, if I just go back to the start here, not too far. So we've gone through this, we've gone through the fetch to code execute cycle just now. We've gone through a lot of stuff in this, but this is only an in a nutshell lesson. So if you're watching this before the lesson has happened, then that's not great. 
because you probably have a clue what's going on. And also some of the things in here are leading on from the GCSE. So feel free to look at the appropriate parts of the GCSE that match this up. It's going to be 1.1 in the GCSE as well. And you should be uh, a lot better. I'll probably put links in the description. Uh, you should understand this a bit better. But if you're on A-level and you've done the GCSE, there's probably going to be enough there for you. All right, thanks.